I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Uh, these words from uh, Revelation appointed here in this season after Easter are good words for us to remember as we gather at a time of beginnings and endings. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and Christ is with us. In that closed room, the risen Christ appeared, and he said to the disciples who had gathered out of fear, Peace be with you. And Jesus breathed upon them the Holy Spirit. Today, we anticipate a fresh wind of the Spirit as we consider ways to end well and to begin well. And as God's faithful people, ending well and beginning well is a marvelous witness uh, to everyone with whom we engage because life is full of endings and beginnings. And we, in living the endings and beginnings that are before us in our lives, each of us, in our congregations and in our ministries, witness the way God is with us in every beginning and in every ending. When I met with the bishop in January to talk about how the academy, as I moved into that position working there for these uh, days. I wanted to know how the academy could work alongside the bishop and the cabinet. And at near the end of that meeting, she said, well, we have this transition seminar. And some of you pastors particularly know that for the last eight years, we have rolled our own. It's all been in-house. We've done our own leadership for this transition day. But Bishop Hope said, why don't we have someone from the outside to come in and lead us? And she sent, then said, and why don't you, Bill and Leah, in our office, why don't you all take care of that? <laughs> well, uh, I, I would have really felt uh, challenged by that, except the fact that I had met somebody, and even within an hour, his name had come to mind as a being the person that would help us. Uh, his name is Doug Anderson. Uh, Doug Anderson is now, this is his fourth time to come to the North Carolina Conference. Uh, the first time he came was to the Burlington District where, where I was a superintendent and then later he, he came back a second time and then the third time he came and did something with the Raleigh District, the Sanford District, the Rocky Mount District, the Wilmington District, and the Burlington Districts. And so some of us know Doug Anderson. He's an ordained elder in the Indiana Conference. He currently uh, serves on the staff of the Indiana Conference as a director of congregational revitalization and development. He's been a former district superintendent, and he's also the executive director of the Reuben Job Leadership Center. Uh, Doug is a remarkable presenter, I think. I, I, I think about, he, he, use, he uses an economy of words. You know, it's sort of rare for preachers to have an economy of words. We usually have an abundance of words. But Doug has, a, I thought about it today, he has just the amount of words that you need to get the idea. As I moved across the Burlington District doing charge conferences, I was continually overwhelmed by the fact that at charge conference, people would say, you remember when, what Doug Anderson said? Uh, mercy, I thought maybe they might remember something I said, but it was Doug Anderson they remembered. And throughout my time there, after Doug appeared in the di district, people were often quoting Doug Anderson. Uh, he's a very gifted presenter, and uh, he, f he flew in last night, flying out late this afternoon to get to another assignment. So, uh, and he's about to retire. This is one of his last gigs, I guess, before he retires in June, and then we'll be just doing consulting. So, Doug, well, welcome back to the North Carolina Conference. Good to have you here. Thank you. Good morning, brothers and sisters in Christ. We are the people that extend forgiveness. Amen? Amen. You do that for me. Amen? Amen? Look at your first sheet. Strike the word Western. Get your pen. Strike it out. Get rid of it. Never happened. As far as East is from West, so are your sins forgiven of you. Amen? All right, so we put that behind us. Uh, it is good to be back with you in the North Carolina Annual Conference. 
As, uh, as Bill said, I've been here on, uh, on a few occasions, always enjoyed my time. How many of you have been with me in some kind of workshop, seminar, et cetera, before this? Outstanding. How many of you, this is your first time to be with me? Bishop, thanks for uh, using the influence of your office for these people to come, because had it been just by reputation, we wouldn't have had these folks here. So <laughs> I want to thank you very much for uh, providing this opportunity. Now, let me sort of just walk you through the day. First, uh, the process is going to be that I'm going to do some presenting, and then I'm going to give you a chance to reflect on, so what will that mean for me? What will that mean for us in the appointment that we're receiving? Okay? So we're going to have that kind of rhythm to our day. So it's not just presenting. It's also you reflecting, sharing, figuring out how you're going to implement that back home. Second. If you've got additional kinds of questions and some additional kind of information you'd like to be able to have beyond what I present to you today, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to refer you to a book, Making a Good Move, by Michael J. Coiner. Mike is the bishop of the Indiana area, and he and I have taught that seminar together uh, over the last about 25 years. So uh, this has evolved and changed as we've done that. But that's helpful. C-O-Y-N-E-R, Coiner. Making a good move. So that resource is available to you um, to, to be able to do follow-up. All right, third. We're going to take a break right at about a little before 11 o'clock because I can either give you a break or you'll go ahead and take a break. So probably better to just give you a break. Now, what we'll do at that point after that we're going to do some kinds of conversation that will be helpful to be together as pastor, parish, and pastor. How many of you uh, know and recognize your pastor or your pastor, parish person in the room? How many of you just don't have a clue? <laughs> All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a chance during the break to sort of look around. And here's what I'd like for you to do. If you don't know your pastor parish person or your pastor, I want you to gravitate to this area up front. So before you go to break, come up front, see if you can figure out who the other is. Kind of like speed dating already, but the date's already been arranged, so you're just trying to find them. Okay? And then go to your break, and when you come back, then make sure that you sit together at a table. Fair enough? Everybody clear? We're good? All right. So this whole moving, changing appointment process really starts before you arrive. And it starts with leaving well. Part of the experience we've had is it's really hard to start well if you don't leave well. You've got to take care of, the, of any kind of baggage stuff that you have. You've got to kind of bring some closure to this. Not just pastors, but also laity. Amen? So let me sort of walk you through uh, what kind of things we found helpful in doing that process. First, just recognizing it's really important to say goodbye as a pastor and really good for lay people to have the opportunity to say goodbye to their pastor uh, regardless of the circumstance of the, of the move or the transition. Now, if I had my druthers, my grandmother grew up in eastern Kentucky, in the hills of Kentucky, so I learned a lot of interesting words that a lot of folks in Indiana don't know, and druthers is one of them. Um, if I had my druthers, I would just about 2 in the morning have the moving truck back up load my stuff in, slip out of town. <laughs> sort of like the Indianapolis Colts did in 1977 when they were the Baltimore Colts and left town, you know. <laughs> I would just kind of load up, leave town, wake up, be at the new place, not deal with all that stuff. But what I realize is that is neither healthy for the church and it's not healthy for me. So we need to make sure that we have opportunities to say goodbye. We need to have some kind of celebration to say goodbye some kind of way for folks to have fun and remember and reminisce. We need to make sure that we say goodbye to the folks that can't come to that kind of occasion. 
the folks who are shut in, the folks in nursing homes, uh, particular groups and ministries that we have as a pastor been significantly involved in. An opportunity to express appreciation, to say goodbye, to shed some tears, and to have some laugh and to be ready to then move on to what comes for the pastor, a new appointment, for the congregation, a new pastor. So that's kind of the first step, is making sure that we plan to say goodbye. Now, at that celebration, I get this. I was a superintendent twice, once for five years, and then for a year and a half in a part-time interim role. And I just want to tell you, there is no such thing as a part-time interim role. It's an oxymoron, okay? <laughs> but, so I did it again for a year and a half. And, and part of what I've discovered across that time is not every move is a time of great sadness. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, there are times that, you know, when the move is announced, People at, at, in the congregation, a, a, a number of them are, are doing their happy dance, you know. <laughs> and then, then there's, there's pastors that when it's announced they're moving, they go, yes, <laughs> finally. Okay? And sometimes it has nothing to do with the behavior, et cetera, of either. It just didn't match, didn't mesh, didn't work. Sometimes it is a relatively small group of folks. And sometimes that group of folks needs to have an opportunity to be dealt with. And sometimes it's a larger group of folks. I get that. And so sometimes there's not a sense of wanting to have a large party or celebration, either by the pastor, pastor's spouse, or the church. You, you understand what I'm saying? Most of the time that's not true. Most of the time we're going to have a wonderful kind of celebration and send-off. Amen? But sometimes it just doesn't feel appropriate. And so therefore, we may not have the big evening bash. We may not have the big celebration in the carry-in. But regardless of the circumstance, there needs to be some opportunity, some reception. And if, and if the leaving is somewhat painful or, or uh, has been a difficult appointment, Having that in the afternoon so that the people who want to come can come and the people that don't, it isn't real uncomfortable. Do you, do you track what I'm saying? Because in every church, no matter how difficult the appointment has been, there are those folks that have found that pastor to be a significant presence of God at significant, pivotal, strategic point of their life. Amen? And they need an opportunity to express their thanks and their appreciation and their support and their prayers for the pastor. So regardless of the setting, where you do a big kind of roast and dinner and gifts or a, uh, a reception where people come who want to have the opportunity to be able to say goodbye, there needs to be significant planned goodbye. Okay. So let me put the thought in your head. Pastor Parrish, members, got, got hands? Let me see. Pastor Parrish folk, okay. Rhetorical question. I always have to do that when I did children's sermons. You know, I had to let them know, because with kids, you ask a question, it's rhetorical, they don't get that. They just blurt back, all right? So I'm not looking for an out, out loud response. I don't want you to be thinking, have you planned the goodbye? Who are you going to put in that group? What kind of conversation you're going to have with the pastor in terms of sorting this out. But you need to begin to, if you haven't already, begin to set a date, plan it, figure out what you're going to do, make it a really good experience of send-off. Okay? All right. Now, let's move on through. Pastors, if you haven't already, you need to be thinking about What's my last sermon or last few sermons going to be? What am I going to share in my last Sunday or last few Sundays? Now, let me start with, here's what's not a good idea, okay? <laughs> now, 
Now, Bishop, you can't make this stuff up, okay? There was a pastor who not only was leaving the church, was retiring. So this was the last sermon that, a pastor, that this pastor would preach in a, in a congregation that he was appointed to, okay? And that morning, his text was, casting pearls before swine. Now, now I'm, I'm just telling you, I don't see any way that can come out good, you know? Now the, now, the thrust of the sermon was, for 40 plus years, I've been casting the pearls of the gospel before you swine-like people, and you just have never appreciated, never responded to it, and finally, I don't have to do this anymore, thank God. That's not the kind of sermon we want you to preach on your last Sunday, okay? Last Sundays are not a time to unpack your own emotional baggage. Whatever kind of leftover or smoldering concern, feeling, that's not the time to do it. Amen? Yeah. Uh, as the hymn reminds us, and uh, it's okay, John, I'm not going to call you up. Um, take it to the Lord in prayer. Sort that out. Don't take it to the pulpit. Okay? Second, this is not the time to put out before the congregation all the things you wish, hoped would happen in the life of the church. To lay that on them is what they need to begin to do and to put that on the agenda of the incoming pastor. So it's not the time to do that. This is the time to say two things. Thanks and goodbye. Okay? Thanks for the opportunity to have served as your pastor. One of the passages I've used on the last Sunday I've found really helpful. The, the sermon almost preaches itself is from Philippians, first chapter, verses 3 through 11. And the core of that text talks about, I thank God for my partnership with you. Now, if at the end of your time of ministry of the congregation, you can't fill in that blank, sell shoes. <laughs> you know? Do, do something else. Because there ought to be all kinds of things that you're thankful for that have happened in and through the lives of the folks in the congregation. And that this ministry we started, I love the way Paul puts it, this ministry we've started will be brought to completion in the day of the Lord. So it doesn't have to be completed while I'm here. It doesn't have to be completed in the tenure or time that the pastor who follows me is here. It will be completed only in the culmination of history in the, in the day of the Lord. And so we just keep moving forward in terms of what God's called, and I'm thankful for what you've done and what you brought. I think the second thing is to say goodbye, and some of that goodbye is, I'm really going to miss you, you know? Owning grief, recognizing the sense of loss, that's a really healthy kind of thing, you know? I'm going to miss you folks. Now, i got to be honest with you, in every church I served, I, I honestly couldn't say, I'm going to miss everybody in the church. Okay? I, I'm just keeping it real. Okay? And so on that Sunday morning, when I would begin to uh, choke up, difficult to continue with my message, I would think of that person. And then I had to fight to break out, to keep from breaking out in a big smile. Yeah, I won't have to deal with them anymore. Now, here's the reality. When a new pastor comes, that pastor isn't going to be perfect. Amen? Not everybody's going to be ecstatic. 
And so I understand that, and I'm not going to meet everybody's expectation. And guess what? Not everybody in the church I'm going to is going to meet my expectation. But we're not called to meet everybody's expectation. We're called to love, and we're called to serve. Amen? So as long as we're there, and together as, as pastor and laity, we're going to love, we're going to serve, we're going to accomplish whatever we can for the sake of the kingdom. And then when that appointment's over... We're going to say goodbye on that last Sunday, and we're going to say thanks. We're good? Uh, A goodbye letter. How many of you have already announced that you're moving? Those of you who are pastors, okay? Did, Did you send a letter? Have you sent a letter yet? Well, good. I'm in good timing then. I'm going to suggest, somewhere between suggest and urge, that you send a letter to the congregation that explains why you're moving. Now, different folks are going to hear different reasons. So you want that to say several things, okay? One of the reasons I'm moving is because I've experienced the hand of God in this move, and God is leading and calling me to this ministry. And I believe that. Amen? Yeah. See, I've sat at a cabinet table. I've seen uh, members of the cabinet pray, talk, discern, agonize over those kinds of appointments. And what's amazing to me, with all those kind of human hands in that process, how often (coughs) the hand of God is discerned in the, in the end. So I believe that. I believe God is in the process, and so as a pastor, I own that. You know, I believe God has called me. Uh, second, I'm United Methodist pastor. I made a decision in 1974 when I was ordained deacon. In those days, you got ordained deacon as a part of the process to become... Jim, you, you know that, right? You experienced that. There you go. 74, I was ordained deacon. 77, I was ordained elder. I'm in my 43rd year under Episcopal appointment. I started one month shy of my 19th birthday. Okay? I reaffirmed that decision in 1977 when I was ordained an elder. So when my bishop called me in January and said, the director of church development has taken early retirement, and will be on vacation until the retirement starts February 1st. Called me on a Friday night. Said, I'm asking if you would consider being the part-time interim director of congregation development. He said, now, I want to give you the weekend to talk to your wife, Jan, to pray about it, to think about it, and then get back to me uh, sometime Monday. I said, Bishop, I don't need to do that. I only have one question. Do you need me to do this? And he said, yeah, I really do. I said, then I'll do it. I said, I'll figure out how to make it work and everything else I do, but I'll do it because I made that decision in 1974. 39 years ago. So, That's a huge reason for me. The bishop asked me to go. I'm going. Amen? Amen. Now, I may be old school, but, you know, I'm proudly old school in terms of appointment systems. So that's a second reason. A third reason is I now have an opportunity to, to assume more responsibility and a new challenge and different kind of skills are going to be required and stretch me. And see, there are lay people in your church that are going to go, they're going to translate that in terms of their own life and language, and they're going, to go, oh, oh, Mary Ann's getting a promotion. <laughs> we wouldn't want to stand in the way of Mary Ann's development. It's been great to see how she's grown in the life of this congregation, served us well. Now she's getting a chance to take those and stretch and use and, and grow. That's awesome. So some folks hear that. You hear what I'm saying? So the letter ought to include 
several reasons, because different people are going to resonate to different reasons. But it's really helpful if you're a lay person to be able to understand not only what's happening, our pastor's leaving, how it's happening, well, they're coming and going somewhere else, but why it's happening. And see, I think that letter really helps with the why. Does that make sense? So I'm big with that. Found that really helpful. Okay. Leave the parsonage. How many of you are pastors in parsonages? Okay. Leave the parsonage in excellent and clean condition. Now, I used to say, leave the parsonage the way you found it. <laughs> I quit doing that. <laughs> it's reported the United Methodist clergy uh, went to a pet store, and at the pet store ordered eight mice, 3,000 fleas, and four dozen cockroaches. Can you get those for me? And the pet store said, well, that's a really bizarre request, but, but yeah, I think I can do that. How soon? Well, a week. I'll be back in a week. So the pastor came back in a week, and there was ready the mice, the fleas, and the cockroaches, and paid, and went to go out the door, and the pet store owner goes, I just... That's such a strange request. I just got to ask, why in the world did you ask for this? I said, oh, well, I'm a United Methodist pastor. I'm moving, and I was told to leave the parsonage the way I found it. <laughs> Do not. See, I didn't say leave the parsonage the way you found it. Leave the parsonage clean and organized and ready to move in. Amen? Amen? Where are my clergy in the room? This is, for me, a huge part of the clergy covenant. You're moving out, guess what? Somebody else is moving in. I want to leave that house so that when the person following me comes in, they don't have to do a thing but move their stuff in. They don't have to clean a shelf. They don't have to sweep a carpet. They don't have to do a repair because I've had the walkthrough of the pastor parish and the trustees, and it is ready to go when they walk in the door. Amen? Amen. That house is the house of the folks in your church. Caring for it, tending for it, being attentive to it, is, is a matter of respect, and I think, again, I'm old school, a matter of integrity. On very few occasions, but occasions, I've gone into a parsonage, invited in by either the incoming pastor or the pastor parish committee to see the house before the move in, and I was horrified. And the pastor and I had a come to Jesus meeting and said, you've got two choices. Get back here and clean this up, or we'll have somebody come in and clean it up, and we will send you the bill or take it out of your salary, because you are not going to leave the house this way. So please, it's a covenant, brothers and sisters, amen? Not only a covenant with clergy, but a covenant with our brothers and sisters in our churches. So a way of leaving to leave well is to make sure the house is in great shape. And trustees, how many trustees I have in the house? Any trustees? Pastor Parish, how many Pastor Parish? Working with the trustees, you make sure that the house is ready for the person to move into. Whatever kind of cleaning, painting, updating, whatever, you're going to get that done as well so that we make this a really good move. Leave necessary notes for the new pastor. You know, it's really helpful, for example, to say, okay, Here's a place where I got my hair cut or got my hair done. Here's a dentist in town we've used. Here's a doctor that we found that's been really good. Um, the biggest one I find that I really appreciate is, here's a mechanic I trust. <laughs> they do really good work. They charge a fair rate. This is where I always take my cars. Um, Here's an annotated 
membership directory, pictorial directory. Now, it's not annotated in the way I saw one person annotate their directory. <laughs> and that is, beside every family was a, was a little stick figure face. And the face either had a big smile, which means the pastor really liked them, or it had a frown, the pastor really didn't like them, or just kind of a straight line, make up your own mind. Okay? <laughs> I mean, what's that about, right? Because here's what I've discovered. The folks I connected really well with may not connect as closely to the pastor who followed me. We're all different. And the person that the pastor before had just a really difficult time with, why, we got along just fine. So I don't want to set that up for the pastor. I don't want that information. Well, Doug, what information do you want? Well, I'd like to know things like, particularly in a smaller church, who's related to who? <laughs> oh, I didn't know they were sisters. Oh, that's helpful to know. Okay. I want to know what persons have had a recent death or divorce so I can know where to be in touch in terms of pastoral care. Who are the persons that are in process toward leadership? Haven't gotten there yet. I've been working to cultivate that. But I'd hate for that not to be followed up because the new pastor simply wasn't aware. Okay? So that kind of information, really helpful coming in uh, for the pastor who's arriving. And then, last but not least, make sure that the church is planning at least as good a hello for the new pastor as they did a goodbye for you. Now, I've had some interesting experiences along the way. In my first appointment that I had on my own, the uh, two-point charge, they believed in economy of meetings. And so they had, on the same occasion, a farewell for the previous pastor and a welcome to me. <laughs> now, uh, pop quiz. <laughs> Who do you think got most of the t attention, conversation, and uh, care? Well, Not me. <laughs> the pastor who's leaving, because they'll get a chance to talk to me in the future. And they don't know me, so they're spending most of their time with the pastor. So first of all, Please, don't plan that on the same day. Okay. Um, second, plan a really good welcome. The best welcome I ever got was when I went to Walker East United Methodist Church. Now, I, I, the, I had a little trepidation going in, and my friends heightened that, because that church had had three pastors in four years. Oh, well, we aren't done yet. No. <laughs> Three pastors in four years who not only left that church, but left ministry. Oh, now you can, ooh. Okay. So when I arrived, uh, it was like second Sunday, they did a welcome, and they presented my wife and I with a really lovely gift. It was a, a really nice floor lamp. I never had a welcome in gift. So I talked to the chair of the pastor parish committee afterwards. I said, well, that was really lovely. Do you do, is this kind of your custom? Have you done, no, never done this before. Said, well, why in the world did you do it here? Said, well, we've had such a difficult time with pastors, we thought that we'd give them a gift while we still wanted to. <laughs> you, you can't make this stuff up, can you? Now, here's the good news. I stayed six years, which, which was the longest pastorate they'd ever had in their 120-some year history. Okay? My successor, who was uh, about 25 years my senior, stayed six years until he retired. Okay? His successor came in 1990 and is now 
finishing his 23rd year there. So in a church that had three pastors in four years, all of whom left ministry, they've now had three pastors in 35 years, all who will have retired from ministry in that conference. That's a change of culture. And I think part of it is, is really getting off to a good start. Amen? Yeah. All right. Now, let me give you some time, about well, five minutes at your table. What have you heard so far that's important for you? What are you noting? What are you remembering? What do you want to make sure you follow through with when you get back home? Everybody clear? Great. I'll interrupt you in five minutes, so enjoy your conversation. <laughs>